Okay, we're back on. Okay, welcome back. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the most important thing we do in a workshop is have breakouts in which we try to tap the minds of all participants to figure out where are the gaps and uh, what can we potentially do together to address them. Um, Rick Avila has taken the lead with uh, Raul, uh, with uh, Javier Zaluta, and uh, with uh, Heidi Roberts in um, leading the breakout group. And Rick, do you want to bring us through your um, conclusions? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. So we had a, a pretty active and engaged session, uh, our breakout session. And I'm going to attempt <laughs> to summarize it. And we have Javier and Heidi to uh, correct me as I go. <laughs> and we also have the rest of the group too. Uh, but um, yeah, so we started off with the question um, to, of defining and managing CT screening findings of early lung diseases. Uh, at first we brought it out and looked at uh, just anything in the thorax. But after a while of developing a bunch of recommendations, um, we came up with uh, kind of a, uh, an overarching goal, which is that we need probably a, a large CT and metadata database. And to get there, we feel that forming a new consortium to create such a database would be the best way to go. Uh, the purpose of the database would be to accelerate the development and deployment of quantitative imaging tools and methods for both CT lung cancer screening and this combination of COPD, uh, uh, emphysema, and interstitial lung disease. The, uh, that's, the, that's the overall goal. Uh, and as you'll see, we, we, it, we don't have to always have a quantitative biomarker, we, we can start off with, uh, with uh, other, other uh, classification methods. Um, <clears throat> so, so uh, you know, we recognize that the CT lung cancer screening data, um, both baseline and follow-up, contains large amounts of information that is highly relevant to, uh, you know, the study of COPD emphasis emphysema, uh, let's say, measurement and tracking and interstitial diseases. Um, and, and in particular, we can use uh, this data to quantify emphysema burden, including potentially changes over time. And, and while no proven pharma therapies presently exist to halt progression of COPD and emphysema, uh, uh, such information has a potential help to change help change patient behavior, such as smoking and, and, and also potentially uh, modifications to their environment, which may be contributing to their emphysema. Um, it also can be useful for efforts to control COPD exa exacerbations and uh, uh, our pulmonologists can help us out with uh, uh, the way in which that can be done. There are numerous other potential quantitative measures uh, that, uh, can be extracted from the CT imaging data. And uh, of course, uh, we don't have time to go through them all, but airways, vessels, uh, all the other things in the lungs, uh, all the other structures in the lungs. Uh, looking at it in, a, in the other direction, quantitative COPD, emphysema, and interstitial uh, disease analysis, um, uh, using this data has a potential to inform and improve the study and management of early lung cancer. And uh, just one example here is can potentially used to improve the quantitative of assessment of lung cancer risk and, and then clinical management decisions related to risk, such as screening interval. There are others, and uh, we, we're not trying to thoroughly uh, list them all, but uh, but you can see that uh, this is a bi-directional set of uh, 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 basically benefits. And then finally, I would just like to note that, that automated, the ultimate goal of reaching automated quantitative measurement 
of uh, CT lung screening data, uh, and then the clinical reporting of it could one day be applied to the hundreds of millions of chest CTs performed annually around the world. And uh, Ella Kazaruni was quick to point out that we have about 80 to 100,000 CT scans of the, of the thorax performed uh, in the US alone each year. So that's the reason, that's the motivation for, for this recommendation. Going into a little bit more of the detail, I, actually, let me stop here. Um, uh, Heidi, uh, Javier, you want to add anything to this? No, I think it was pretty well summarized. It was essentially the discussion between what can we see on the on the CT scans, what can we report on the CT scans in a um, standardized fashion, and then a lot about validation. And most of what um, we just heard about is about the validation part. Yes. So just to you know, it was it was pointed out yesterday that um, what what it would be looked for in this kind of setting is is uh, hypothesis generating uh, research, and then which would need prospective validation. And I guess something that we should add here at some point is you know what how what would the size of this uh, data set uh, uh, be or, or needed to be in order to to be able to generate those hypotheses. Yeah, so we'll go into the additional slides here in a, in a, in a, in a second. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of open questions for sure. So why don't I just continue a little bit further and then we'll, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, so we broke it down into a short-term goal, which would focus mainly on retrospective data collection uh, and a longer-term goal, which would, would focus again, actually focus on prospective data. Um, so from a retrospective data collection point of view, the initial collection goals and aims, of course, would need to be carefully determined and outlined. Uh, and uh, it is, it is uh, also recognized that a major goal of this collection effort is to support hypothesis generating research. So this would be uh, at the minimum data that would be, we'd be looking for uh, relationships and correlations that might inform a hypothesis. Uh, so we would get quantitative lung uh, phenotyping, uh, we would get quantitative lung phenotyping data from algorithmic uh, analyses. And we, we could invite a lot of actually algorithm developers in to run on against the data and produce uh, data that might be useful in that regard. Uh, across uh, emphysema, airway, and, and you know, fibrosis uh, types of analyses. If we can obtain spirometry and other relevant uh, clinical tests and patient, let's say patient reported conditions, uh, we can evaluate, we can look for correlations across those as well. And if we can further obtain quality of life and mortality, you know, longer term outcome information. This is retrospective data, so there's a chance. Uh, the, 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 the data and the hypotheses generated could support, um, you know, a, a, a lot of research, but, uh, but launching pivotal studies and trials. There appeared to be um, a, a pretty strong interest from the group uh, we had a pretty high power group there, uh, uh, and we do here, uh, in supporting this initiative and exploring what can be accomplished um, within a year. I kind of threw that timeline in. I hope I uh, didn't overstate the uh, aggressiveness of this. <laughs> but, uh, but, but that's a short-term goal. Uh, next, we'll go to the, to the long-term goal, uh, which would be the prospective data collection. We put a lot more recommendations in here because we have a, a bit more control over what happens in prospective data collection. Uh, so th this is a real major opportunity here to collect high quality data informed by both the literature and our short-term results, the, the, re the retrospective analysis. And we can launch uh, lung imaging research studies that leverage um, Quant quantitative imaging resources and capabilities. We have a major advantage right out of the gate because with this team that we even have here, and I'm sure others would join, uh, we, we already have a real world-class team with the needed multidisciplinary expertise. And uh, 
I know it's uh, uh, probably known by most, but it's important to point out that um, we have very strong, of course, representation here from pulmonology, radiology, AI, computer vision, medical physics, statistics, metrology, and I just put information technology. I know I'm missing some fields here, but this is, a, this is the team that you need to really study this and get the most out of that CT data for lung uh, screening um, purposes. Uh, <clears throat> examples of data collection analysis goals and studies. We could compare old and new methods uh, and sources of data so we could, we could we could, uh, we could compare, uh, let's say, the, the retrospective data that we have against the prospective data and other, uh, other studies uh, prospectively, if you will. Uh, we can independently validate uh, basically the newly developed automated analysis method, auto automated analysis methods, which, which uh, some of which have been reported this year and have, you know, uh, particularly for uh, measuring the CT scans for COPD. Semi-quantitative rating scales are a step toward fully quantitative scores. So classifications like mild, moderate, severe for COPD uh, can be used at, uh, certainly at the start. Um, and uh, you know, this is the quantitative imaging workshop, but we need to take, we need to walk before we can run. So it's okay to have, um, you know, nominal uh, uh, subjective scores to start with. And we can explore the use of Fleischner Society's um, emphysema scoring method. And apparently they also have one for interstitial disease as well. Uh, longer term, we can look at public health outcomes, potentially prove we can reduce, and co uh, reduce cost and major outcomes, which can be designed into the trials. Um, it would be good to collect uh, patient reported symptoms, not just, um, you know, the things that we, we measure directly. And we, we uh, what, one idea was that uh, after a tool, uh, let's say maybe indicated that COPD was present, uh, maybe newly present, uh, you could have an algorithm basically uh, recommend spirometry um, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, potentially uh, change the course of, uh, of that patient, uh, again, from a quality of life point of view, perhaps. We need to keep in mind that disease state information may already be known and, be, and, and is being already managed. So we, even though the quantitative tool might discover something like uh, a particular disease state, uh, the, the, the health record and the, the physician and patient may already be, uh, be aware of it and be managing it. So um, it's not, a, so, so we need just to keep that in mind. In addition to lung cancer uh, and COPD emphysema, we have addition, we, we, we can have additional projects uh, going beyond those, including coronary, coronary calcium, liver, and many other, um, some people call uh, uh, incidental findings. Uh, we need to establish, of course, uh, standard nomenclature across the participating sites for this, uh, which is possible with a, a, a prospective data collection. And we will also need to maintain good scanner protocol calibration and op uh, optimize for the, the clinical decision tasks that we're, 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 we are uh, basically focused on. This is, uh, as anybody who's been involved with the Kiba effort, uh, whether it's lung density, lung nodules, or other things, this is particularly important. The good scanner calibration and optimization is particularly important for measuring change of a metric over time. So that summarizes our, uh, our main recommendations. And I don't know, Heidi and... Uh, Javier, do you want to say anything more about these last two slides? No, again, very well summarized and would be um, looking forward to hearing the comments from comments from the um, larger audience. See if there are any questions. I agree. So, Rick? Yeah. Uh, a couple of comments. Um, one um, kind of a 
flip comment. Um, you were talking about standardizing um, uh, nomenclature across participating sites and stuff like that. One of the first things we have to do is stop calling heart disease and COPD an incidental finding. <laughs> if we want to maintain that acronym, we can call it an important finding because these are the number one and number three cause of premature death on the planet. And that's just a trifle more than incidental where I come from. And, and, and I, I don't think we can undermine our, 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 the importance of what we're doing by our, ter our methodology. But uh, more seriously, uh, no, that is serious, but in addition. Um, uh, but, but you'll note that the, I don't believe we use the word incidental in here. Uh, that, that actually was, was underlined quite a bit during the meeting. We all agreed over that too. Okay, okay. Even though it, that the word was used liberally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, but yeah, but we got. My fault. Uh, it came up in the presentation because I said it. So sorry. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. That's. Uh, I stepped on the landmine. I guess you could. Say. Yeah, for sure. Um, Mary Ellen Geiger in a presentation yesterday talked about the efforts they're doing nationally with COVID and whatnot, and one of the very important things they did that we've talked about, but I think you know, in the context of what you're just discussing, is important to. Uh, to uh, potentially uh, pull to the fore. And that is in these collections, we should intentionally start collecting images for like teaching, the teaching files and stuff like that that we've talked about in the past. In addition, um, a, a collection of images that will make commonly available with desired characteristics for a, uh, a developmental database for um, you know, the purposes of tool development and whatnot for the larger community. And then like they did with the FDA, potentially sequester uh, an element of the database, high quality, all the, all the, um, uh, all the uh, correlative information available so that they can have a validation matrix to um, allow us to be more confident about the performance of, of, uh, of some of these tools with real world data. And I know this is something we've talked about and you, you are very supportive of, but I, I think we should state it explicitly because Lord knows this community needs those resources. Great. I think we all agree. So I have a few comments, Rick. You there? Am I? Yeah. So I'll start off by maybe saying something uh, a bit provocative and purposely provocative to my pulmonary colleagues. I was uh, taken by the, the sense that there's a real sense of frustration of the lack of progress in developing any, any reasonable treatment for emphysema to the point where there's the idea that maybe all of what we're doing with quantification and getting you know, down to percentages and whatnot of extent of emphysema may not even be that valuable uh, because after all, there's not much you can do anyway. And I think that that's, to me, you know, if that's the prevailing attitude, then this whole endeavor is on shaky ground. Um, but I think what we really need to be doing is thinking about, um, because I don't, I don't think that's true. Now, I, I don't have a drug that's going to necessarily work, but I think the action in emphysema is gonna be on early disease. And, and how do you measure early disease and how you measure um, change, especially, which I know this, this is focusing on in terms of, of how, you, how we're gonna measure change, especially in early disease and, and how we go about doing that. But I think all of this should be with a view towards, um, if we're setting up a consortium, I think the idea of a consortium should be built with a view towards uh, getting these tools that measure change uh, in, a, in a reasonable way, and then putting together the group that can test uh, the various potential drugs that are out there for early disease. Uh, and that's gonna come from the screening population. We're gonna get early cases. And how do we have a network that can start testing some of these drugs in early trials? Because that's where the action is gonna be. If we, can, if we can start demonstrating that we can uh, put together a network that can test this, and the people, you have enough people in this group right now attending between uh, Matthias, uh, uh, Claudia, um, Heidi, you know, several people here, you know, 
we already could put together. So we should be thinking in terms of putting together, and this really should, you know, the idea of putting together a treatment group, uh, I think, you know, Javier, uh, Al, Rizzo, and perhaps there's some other pulmonologists on the group should be really taking the lead in, in helping us to organize uh, all of what we're doing with a view towards treatment trials of early stage disease. So that's, that's my thought. Dave, this is Al. I'll jump in. I, I agree completely with you. I also take the approach that the pharmaceutical uh, treatment is one thing, but I think uh, I tend to be frustrated because, and I'll date myself, back in the 80s when I would get a chest x-ray that said emphysema, that I was referred patients for that reason, and I talked to patients about that, and I think what we're missing here is we just got to get the point across that something's found that's not expected to be there, an intervention, even if it's without pharmacologic measures, can be important. Raising the awareness of the patient of what's going on, what they can do besides take medicine to improve their health. That's wonderful. I'm all for everything you just said. And I no, think- no, I, I agree. I think that's a really important point you're bringing out that it may not just be pharmacologic intervention. We don't really know so much the, the natural course of early, early or, or as I was corrected yesterday, even mild disease. We don't know the natural course of some of these things. I'll just interject that, you know, the Lung Association is starting a, a millennial cohort study, 25 to 35 year olds specifically look at peak lung function and then to monitor it over the course of the next 10, 15, 20 years to see if we can develop uh, the cholesterol for lung disease like they did for heart disease. So that's going on and starting up later this year but before that even gives us information, I think we all realize that finding these things on, on scans uh, is important. And I, and I think Jim Molshai may have mentioned this before. This just adds one more beneficial reason to promote lung cancer screening because it gives more benefit to the patient to find these other non-cancerous uh, issues uh, and outweighs that risk of you know, unnecessary procedures and anxiety and things of that nature. So I think it's all head in the right direction uh, I would just like to see a timeline that's a little, little more, a little shortened if I could. And all for figuring out next steps to help set up this consortium, because I think there are funding bodies who would help put together a network like this. I like the term bonus findings better. Additional important findings. Yep. Any other comments? Great job, Rick. Uh, we had a great team. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, and um, there was a chat in the morning session from Chris Amos about the importance of smoking cessation. And to Al's comment, um, at the very least, and Javier made this point, um, you know, finding COPD emphysema in the setting of screening identifies people at higher risk of lung cancer. And if those people are continuing to smoke, and we've seen, you know, some of the trial data that we've seen over the course of this workshop, you know, 50 to 70% of the people coming into these screening studies are still smokers across the world. So, you know, if we can just use it as an adjunct to um, customize, personalize the, the uh, tobacco cessation intervention, that would be a giant win. Anything else, Rick? I think we've covered uh, our, our, our recommendations. Okay, very nice, uh, thank you. Um, we'll move to the second breakout group now and uh, I think we'll post the um, summary document. Uh, this was um, a session um, on the um, approaching advanced combined modality therapy, early stage screen detected disease, adjuvant neo neoadjuvant therapy. We've heard about this in the uh, presentations today. Um, this breakout was uh, led by um, Dr. Ian Kelovitz, uh, Rowena Yip and myself. And um, uh, I will go ahead and just read some of the summary document that uh, Rowena and David helped me put together. Um, we had a series of questions. And uh, so we'll go through 
what the group uh, responded to the various questions. Some of this has already been well covered, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, be efficient in my comments. So um, we've had some early success with the uh, more advanced stage cancers, especially with the Adora trial that we uh, heard about today from Dr. Herbst and his colleagues. Uh, is it time to think about um, moving to earlier stage 1A in this setting? And so um, the group was very interested in doing this. There was uh, the comments about the fact that, uh, you know, the meta-analysis discussed today and yesterday had suggested that there was uh, potential harms in early stage, very early stage disease associated with the use of, of conventional chemotherapy. And so there's a, a caution about dealing with a, uh, a group of people that in general have a very high curative potential and we had the discussion about how to, how to call out uh, that through molecular, pathological, or imaging approaches, um, as you all recently remember. And so um, we want to focus in on the aggressive stage one disease for additional therapy, and we could potentially do that a variety of ways. <clears throat> We heard from uh, Phil Dennis that even, you know, the pharmaceutical companies are, are, are aware of the fact that with WNA disease, there's different considerations. And, and I think we covered that well in the panel. And that was a source of some discussion yesterday with the breakout. Uh, if I can move this screen up a bit, please. Thank you. That's fine. Um, there's a... Um, there's a variety of surgical issues that did come up uh, that were real world issues. And so um, even though there is this consistent 10% of people that recur um, uh, with stage 1A disease, fighting them and, um, uh, is, is a challenge as we discussed. But the issue is, um, do you approach all these people or do you only focus in on the people that for some reason or another have these signatures of, of additional risk? Our group concluded, and I think it was mirrored the discussion today, that it's probably necessary to, to focus on only that subset that have whatever features we determine to be uh, um, important in terms of more of an aggressive, uh, aggressive um, natural history. Now, Still in all, we have to keep thinking about the fact that um, early disease, there's issues of local regional, there's issues of, of disseminated disease. And as Dr. Lahill pointed out, there's also considerations of field carcinogenesis, where in those individuals that have a first cancer, we have to be concerned about additional carcinos carcinization that has occurred throughout the rest of the respiratory tract and there'll be second and third cancers potentially. And so as we start approaching these people, I think we have to be very careful in, in focusing on what we are trying to address. And at what point in the natural history, it's more important to concern ourselves with local regional dynamics versus systemic dynamics in the metastatic setting versus field carcinogenesis things. And at least initially, if we're, um, you know, uh, going through uh, the logic that we uh, discussed yesterday, the pr principal uh, focus will be adjuvant. In an adjuvant setting, uh, really the, the, the therapeutic intent will be uh, across the local regional uh, bed of, of the tumor resection. And we'll come to some more of the surgical considerations in the course of this discussion. Okay. Um, risk of recurrence, radiological characteristics. We've heard about this. Um, as, as suggested uh, by uh, Dr. Ukirk and Dr. Yankelovitz, perhaps doubling time emerges as the most likely um, uh, critical feature that would allow us to select for adjuvant therapy. Um, we, we talked about the Adura trial yesterday, and, and it's, it was a trial done in individuals from uh, sequencing that had uh, demonstrated presence of activating EGR, EGFR mutations. And so that's a subset of a subset. So even though they had very robust findings in that group, in thinking about all stage 1A patients, they will not necessarily all be 
uh, the EGFR approach will not be relevant to all of them. So that's when we got into the idea that we're, we're going to be looking at other targets, as Dr. Uh, Herbst suggested, uh, with um, uh, immunotherapy, potentially we can, we can treat more broadly. But it brings into uh, focus the fact that um, we're going to have to have more than one target that we'll be evaluating because no one target covers all the, uh, all the subsets of, of, of aggressive disease. And so um, we've talked about in previous years, um, Dr. David Jablons presented his very nice data about using a, um, a, a PCR panel to, um, dis to delineate a group of stage one a or actually stage one disease that had a more uh, aggressive phenotype. And, um, and he cross validated that in China and that was a potential marker. And I'll, I'll remind you of the discussion we just had with Dr. Westube and others about this. And it's, it's not clear that anything's ready for prime time. So um, we're going to have, you know, a little bit of challenge and yet um, to satisfy the desires of Al Rizzo and lots of other people, we'd like to do this in our lifetime. So starting with some approach such as using a uh, relatively simple and accessible imaging uh, a doubling time or something like that seems to be along the lines of our discussions today. And that, and that uh, was uh, very, very much in line with what we just heard from the, from the discussion group. Uh, again, can we raise the um, text a bit? Thank you. Um, we spent a certain amount of time yesterday talking about the fact that uh, stage 1A disease um, is, is a, uh, a group in which toxicity will be a larger consideration for people that have avert stage 3, stage 4 disease. And we talked about um, the uh, preference there for a drug that potentially had a low possibility of mortality. Um, there was concerns about immunotherapy because even though we've gotten so much better in delivering immunotherapy and managing the side effects, there still is the rare patient that uh, doesn't do well. And in a setting of a potentially curative population with stage 1A, those types of considerations uh, are very important. So again, we were kind of looking for the early win in, 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 in what we were going to propose. So an early win is using doubling time because we kind of know how to do it and there's a literature supporting it and stuff like that. Uh, in terms of um, for a initial trial construct, an early win may be to focus on adjuvant therapy. Um, the reason for, for that is, um, and I uh, asked to move the uh, page up a little bit, well, is because um, in, in the consideration from the surgical perspective, referral of patients is a, is a real issue. And so even though, as suggested uh, by some of the speakers previously, we have an educational gap and we're going to have to talk to patients first and explore options and we're going to have to you know, work with the surgeons to make sure that everybody feels comfortable. But there's a lingering concern that has been a real problem for accrual of other types of new adjuvant trials. So we want to start out with early wins. So we want to focus on drugs that don't have uh, high probability mortality. We want to focus on drugs where delays to surgery are not going to be um, uh, potentially uh, a big deal. So we, um, we, we talked about that in, in light of, of some of the uh, issues that were echoed in the, uh, in the breakout from the um, uh, session we just completed. Endpoints um, for these immunotherapy new adjuvant studies and, and whatnot uh, reflect the complexity of, of what we just heard about. You know, there's nothing that is definitive. And so there's an absolute understanding that we'll have to cast a broad nest in looking at endpoints. And so that means that we'll look at imaging and, you know, primary doubling time. But in addition, as a secondary feature, we'll look at other imaging signatures, some of which were discussed by Rick. We'll be looking at, 
molecular endpoints. We'll be looking at pathology endpoints. We, we understand that some of these things may uh, be important by themselves, but when used in aggregate, they, they drop off as, as conveying information. And so uh, we're gonna have to use advanced computational approaches uh, to make sure that we're, we're getting the, the most possible information in terms of discriminating biologically important signals that are occurring from whatever source. So as um, Dr. Hirsch uh, pleaded, we will use multidisciplinary approaches. Okay, uh, continue moving the slide up, please. Thank you, the text up. Um, it was nice to hear from uh, Dr. Herb's uh, presentation and certainly in his publication, the New England Journal that, um, you know, the uh, Adura uh, uh, EGFR third generation compound was very well tolerated. And, um, you know, there was grade one and two toxicity, rare grade three, and that's such an important consideration in these early diseases. Um, again, the surgical considerations in new adjuvants um, uh, is something that we have to keep talking to our surgical colleagues about. And, um, um, and we wanna keep things initially simple. As we move on in terms of the evolution of this consortium that Dr. Yankelovitz and Avila have described, perhaps we can start getting into some of these areas where there's um, more complexity because we have um, you know, figured out how to do things efficiently, but uh, we wanna walk before we run, uh, as someone else commented earlier. Um, continued uh, moving the text up, please. We've covered a lot of those points. Um, you can read these things. We'll make this, uh, this summary available when we uh, finalize it after the meeting to all the meeting participants. And anybody who has comments, uh, please feel free to uh, use the uh, chat or question function or send an email to myself, Dr. Ian Kelvitz or Dr. Uh, Rowena uh, after the meeting and we'll try to get those answers back to you. So um, one of the things that we discussed and it came forward today with the comments of Dr. Herbst and um, Natasha Lael um, was the uh, idea about basket approaches in this very, very specialized setting. Uh, we fortunately have uh, a mechanism that Dr. Kalovitz and Henschke and others have already, and, uh, have already set up in which we can have potentially large numbers because um, if we're dealing with um, entities that, first of all, stage one disease is a small fraction of all lung cancer, hopefully with screening that will change through the years very quickly, but the wolves and sheep clothing are still a small percentage. And so we'll have to try to uh, figure out a, um, a concentration mechanism so that we can make sure that we get enough of these patients that we can do meaningful studies in, in a timely fashion. And that was the driver for the basket trials that have been up and running and ongoing that Dr. Hirsch had talked to us about and others. And it certainly seems to make sense in this setting as well. Uh, we've covered a lot of those points. Uh, okay, so we talked a little bit about uh, what message is sent to the patient and what is what is critical. And um, I think it's never too early to start talking to people about, uh, especially the lung cancer advocacy community and others, about um, what we're thinking about doing and why, why is this important? And I think that uh, Phil Dennis had mentioned that the fact that we have right now very robust tools to manage early stage breast cancer and through neoadjuvant and adjuvant strategies, enhance the cure rate of breast cancer so that breast cancer is not a death sentence today. It's an eminently manageable, curable thing and that's the state, the future state that we want to be at with lung cancer and potentially some of these other uh, very important <laughs> additional bonus findings uh, that we see on thoracic CT. And so um, 
we have that opportunity, but I think we have to not keep it a secret. We have to talk to patients about this is the next step. Why are we going there? And, and, and potential lung cancer advocates that have you know, been involved in lung cancer for a while and kind of understand the benefit of moving to earlier curable uh, 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 stages of intervention because uh, that will provide for a higher cure rate as opposed to um, uh, um, more kind of uh, palliative type of approaches. So we're gonna be thinking about how do we message this to the broader community and uh, it's gonna be a very important part of our strategy. Next slide. I mean, uh, please keep moving. Uh, so it, it has been discussed and we mentioned that um, staging, you know, has been undergoing dynamic changes to uh, onboard the more recent findings in terms of pathology and molecular uh, molecular diagnostics, and this will continue. This is especially important in trying to flesh out our understanding of stage 1A disease and the spectrum of, of uh, biological entities that occur even in this part of early lung cancer. And this might involve both molecular issues as well as immunoprofiling as it was um, discussed just recently. And the immunoprofiling sounds very, very important. And that may help us to refine the selection of the wolves amongst the lamb. And um, this, this is something we all look forward to. Final comment. We uh, discussed yesterday that uh, Nasser al Torki with David Yankelevich and John Hamick had uh, worked with uh, GlaxoSmithKline to do a neoadjuvant window trial. This was a proof of concept trial that this uh, second generation uh, uh, vascular directed therapy had potential for uh, benefit in lung cancer. The trial itself was done and reported and we learned so much from that trial. As we're developing new types of targets for early lung cancer, it may be important to also use that same kind of mechanism to understand all the signaling dynamics and, and how a drug is interacting with different types of hosts relative to different genetic, genetic variation and stuff like that. So window of opportunity trials are part of drug development as opposed to part of routine care but we think it's an important mechanism and we would potentially be interested in the right setting to also sponsor that kind of experimental type of, 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 of trial to enhance our understanding of the biology of early lung cancer so that our therapies are more effective. And so that was discussed and I just mentioned it because um, it, it is a very exciting time for us to understand the earliest drivers of cancer, especially as we start trying to find things that have uh, impact in broader subsets than five or 10% so that we can be more efficient in the therapeutics that we develop for uh, not only uh, adjuvant, neoadjuvant, but potentially chemo prevention and other types of approaches. So uh, I'll stop there. Um, David or Rowena, anything to add? Yeah, do you wanna say anything first? No. So yeah, Jim, I, I'll just, maybe I'm just echoing, but this is, this is a, tr this kind of trial is, is going to happen. You know, I, I don't think anybody sh doubts that, that, that it really needs to happen. It's just a question of when we do it. Uh, we're already seeing, you showed that slide earlier that th there's a crossover. We're seeing, we're now seeing more stage one can stage one and early stage cancers than late stage. And this is going to be happening hopefully at hospitals throughout the country, throughout the world. And so treatment is gonna to shift to stage one. And I think that uh, the kind of trials that you're outlining, the steps that you outlined uh, are, are gonna happen and we can make it happen very soon rather than waiting you know, uh, decades for this, this kind of trial to occur. I think all the, all the pieces of the puzzle to do this are there. Um, I think the identifying those cases, you know, that will just continue to improve. I think the mechanisms are already existing. I can just tell you, we already see a signal for, for doubling times being a good predictor. Uh, just on the LCART data, we already see that. 
as, as being a, a predictor. We see even PET scanning being a good predictor uh, of who's going to, and, and, and those kind of signals, whether it's a blood-based marker, are, are going to continue to improve. So the question, as you're outlining, as to how we design this into a trial um, and put all these pieces working towards this common goal, I think is what needs to be discussed. And I was just delighted that we had, um, you know, industry at this meeting uh, showing their their recognition that this is needed and, and, and going to happen. So I think we're really on a very good track here. And I think I'd love to see more, more people join the Elkhart Consortium and contribute their stage one cases, uh, because I think this is really the way we need to go. Thank you, David. Rowena, anything? No, Rowena echoes all our comments, Jim. Uh, Rowena is doing some beautiful modeling and hopefully we'll be hearing from that in the not too distant future because it has enormous relevance in helping us deconvolute all this incredibly complicated information. We have a chat comment from Steve Lamb and uh, I'm not sure when this came in, but Steve, um, appreciate your participation. Um, the, uh, and he's saying emphysema is only part of COPD and there's evidence by Hogg and others, uh, colleagues from Vancouver, that um, loss of small, small airways is a marker disease of disease that progression. Was in the prior session, Jim. Okay, so, but it, it gives me a chance to pivot a little bit because what we're talking about setting up for early disease management for lung cancer is going to mirror what they're going to need for early disease management for COPD. And so in this setting where we're going to be doing screening and every time we find a screen detected cancer, that's about one in a hundred, we're going to potentially be talking about, you know, opportunities to learn things from their data and potentially to um, um, do additional uh, activities that we've been discussing. But in that same group of 100 patients that we look at, we're going to find evidence of emphysema COPD in about what, you know, Javier, you know, pick the population, 25%, 30%, 40%, whatever. And that's a disease, uh, COPD, where we're kind of at um, where lung cancer was in the 1980s. There was no treatments for lung cancer, you know, prior to the VA studies and stuff like that. And um, over the last couple of decades, we've been able to make really remarkable progress. In COPD, if we have these tools that can look quantitatively and at signatures that allow us to look at change over time, we have the necessary ingredients for much more successful, much more efficient drug development. And um, we discussed yesterday the Cantos trial that was done by Novartis with Ridker uh, in uh, advanced cardiovascular disease and it had a, a markedly beneficial effect published in the New England Journal. And then that same study population was studied for the effect of the IL-1 beta antibody that was used to blockade uh, in those cardiovascular patients in that large phase three trial. And as we saw in that paper in Lancet last year, or the year before, that there was a 45% reduction in mortality for lung cancer in the experimental arm. And just this week in Annals of Internal Medicine, we see another follow-up study from that same Canto study data set in which in the experimental arm, they also had a reduction osteoarthritis manifested in both hip and knees in that same study population. So we're gonna be talking about classes of immunomodulators that we know we're going to be using in lung cancer that are gonna have effect on inflammation in other compartments. And in the setting of thoracic imaging, where we're finding high frequency numbers of COPD, high numbers of cardiovascular disease, in excess of the number of lung cancer cases we're finding, we're gonna have the opportunity to explore the impact of those immunomodulation strategies across all those tobacco-related disease compartments. And so this is an exciting systems biology approach to, to chronic disease management that we have never been able to do before. We've been kind of balkanized by organ sites. But in the chest, we have this opportunity to start looking at these mechanisms because with the kind of database that Rick's talking about us putting together, 
we're going to have endpoints that are relevant for sure in lung cancer. We're going to want all that information. But 98% of that information is also going to be relevant to COPD or perhaps to coronary artery disease. So it's a very important public health opportunity. Um, so uh, in addition, in the um, Q&A, we had a, a question about uh, Fred Granis. I think we've kind of covered this. And you know, Fred points out that 8% of screen detected uh, 1As uh, surgically resected will recur and die. So it's a small number. So um, uh, what's the degree of precision you can, you can you know, achieve in terms of molecular methods? And I think we discussed that. Uh, um, I think um, our wise panelists were skeptical about any of the molecular markers being ready for prime time. But I think they were all optimistic as we start rolling out a, a more comprehensive understanding of these different pathways of cancer, we'll, we'll get molecular markers that may, in fact, complement what we've been talking about in terms of imaging markers in a way that allows us to do better personalization of care for our patients. And, um, but it's a, a hill we got to climb yet. Um, are there other questions or concerns? We have uh, a number of panelists still uh, on the line here. Any additional comments that people want to make at this point? Matthias, I see you, I see you frowning. Are you um, concerned? No, yeah, from overseas, it's um, very interesting the way you are discussing those, uh, those issues. We are, of course, setting up here a network and uh, we hope to start with uh, no, almost everything that has been discussed today uh, next year. And from this, I get the impression that uh, the major thing that should be overcome, and that's the big concern, of course, of Rick Avila, is the standardization. The standardization of the acquisition method, the standardization of the processing of the data, the standardization also of the analysis of the data. And I think the, the KIVA initiative uh, is a very important one, but uh, it should be, uh, I, I think that really should be accelerated to be successful, especially in the, in, in the field that we are, that is uh, the quantitative imaging of, of the chest diseases. I think the opportunities are the best there for quantitative analysis. But we should um, also, in terms of the acquisition uh, conditions, be uh, more stringent. And I think that should be that should come from uh, that should come from the Kiba group. And uh, Rick and his group and the Kiba group have a, have, have of course already a lot of information, as we already uh, discussed together when we were in the ISLAC meetings. And um, from this, I understood that the, it's a major concern that the quality is not comparable. Um, uh, that is what we should discuss also, I think, with, uh, with the vendors. Um, there should be set, I think, by the RSNA, especially standards by which you have to, which you have to meet to, uh, to do quantitative imaging. Yeah. So yeah. with... with 10 year old CT systems, you, you yeah. So Matthias, yes. let me, Matthias. Um, that's my, that's a big concern. Yeah, <laughs> you you asked for a, very, a big concern. <laughs> it's a very appropriate concern. But one of the things that's come out across so many of those things that the most powerful biomarkers are gonna be the ones that look at change in a feature over a time interval. And that's growth factor, uh, growth rates right now. But in so many other of these biological assays, you never know what baseline is. But it's also often very informative once you have a couple of serial data points, you can sort out these, yep. these, these biological implications in a much clearer fashion. But the ability to measure change over time is extraordinarily complicated. And I think we've got to articulate to all our, all our colleagues that you know, precision and all this other stuff relates to the confidence interval that we can bound our findings about whether a change across a time interval is 
biological related to a disease entity versus all the other confounders that come into all these processes. Now, this is all true, but uh, we, we are in a stage that a little, is still a little bit more fundamental. At the moment, of processing pa packages to measure diameter and, uh, and volume, a very simple thing, are still very much depending on the settings of, of the image where you do your measurements on. Now, it should be kernel independent, it should be setting independent, it should be uh, windows and uh, independent. So there's a lot to do and it's yeah. still not done. And the, the, the vendors are just selling their products as the best, but there is no proof for anything of this. The, the, they, and if you, if you compare it, for example, uh, to the development of the dimer, I, I did that before. We were working on in the Netherlands on guidelines for the use of the dimer, and it all uh, it all boiled down after two or three years of discussion, comparable discussions, that as long as the vendors would not really comply to standards that would be set by us, nothing would happen. So at the end, uh, it started with five for, for pharmaceutical companies that came together at the end and said, "Okay, we have to standardize." And that is how it took six years only to get a standardized D-dimer test. But now uh, the D-dimer is, of course, you know, uh, yeah, it's it's a test that is done by millions uh, each year. Um, it's very cheap and it's extremely high standardized and extremely sensitive and can rule out thromboembolism just by one dollar. Yes. So. That, that's, that's the direction we go. I think we should go into. So standardization from the vendors must be a message that sh should be sent to them and not with a brochure that they are the best and that they can do everything but proof, hard line proof that they meet standards that we set. Yeah. Thank you, Matthias. Um, I think the group here, you're um, preaching to the choir. And I think that really supports the idea of a consortial approach in which we have a lot of people involved in the development. So we have buy-in of a great expert community in terms of the soundness of the standardization types of approaches. Okay, we're approaching, we're approaching the um, end of our time. Um, any can final make, burning on comments? We have a final yeah, burning I mean, comment. One, uh, one remark on the biomarkers. So at, at the moment, uh, we should discuss also, I think, which kind of role do we foresee first for uh, implementation of biomarkers in a diagnostic algorithm? And I think it would uh, help us enormously if we who, uh, would have uh, a biomarker, uh, whatever you call it, the liquid biopsy or whatever, with an extremely high negative predictive value, which uh, renders out, for example, 50% of all the candidates that could come to the CT examination. And therefore, I think there will be uh, biomarkers with uh, a signature of uh, it can be very broad a whole kind of uh, uh, constituents of the uh, of the plasma which more or less uh, predicts that the chance of developing lung cancer in that signature will be extremely low so um, i think that's a complete other uh, direction of developing biomarkers then at the moment that they are focusing on the positive predictive value. Okay, thank you very much, Matthias. Um, final comments, David. I'll say amen to uh, what I just heard. Uh, this is, I, I thought it was a very good session, Jim. I thought, I thought you captured, um, the meeting captured what we hoped for. So nothing additional to add. Yes, uh, thanks, David. Uh, I want to thank all the chairs, the moderators, the presenters, the uh, participants, uh, and all the people that help us. Those, this concludes the breakout session, but please, uh, we're going to break for lunch, but we'll be back uh, for a very, very uh, important session because um, we have a lot of great ideas. The question is, how do we drive it the last 100 feet into clinical implementation? And that has turned out to be across medicine an incredibly challenging thing. And so uh, our final session in the afternoon, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 
is population health metrics, HEDIS and STARS. And this, this is a discussion about how we would potentially address this in the United States. And I understand we have an international audience, but the dynamics of how this is done country by country is gonna be different, but fundamentally critical issues are gonna be shared regardless of what national context we're talking about. And so uh, Bruce uh, Pyanson and Indita McLaughlin have put together again, an all-star cast of experts who have worked on these issues across a variety of disease entities. And I think they have some very important information for us if we want to really bring these things into clinical implementation as we move and try to catch up with the rest of the world in terms of addressing <laughs> medicine with a more population health perspective. So uh, thank you very much. We'll rejoin at uh, 1.15. Thank you and have a good day. Uh,